top. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay. Yes, I'd like to thank cars.com for their sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's actually, there's something really amazing about seeing a commercial before an artist lecture. I kind of love that. So, um, okay. Uh, when I do artist lectures, I try to ask each host institution, uh, you know, give me something a little bit more like human, right? Give me sort of like an anchor to help me understand what might be especially productive for the students. And um, I got great advice, which is um, perhaps uh, a focus on some of the more socially engaged works. So um, I've been doing stuff since I got an MFA from Columbia College in photography since uh, in 2003. And uh, I'm pretty uh, intense and committed to kind of making a, a real archive of everything I've done over the years. And so I just sort of want to remind you that if you're curious about works that I've made that aren't as socially engaged, but that kind of contextualize the work I'm gonna show you, um, my website is myname.com. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer in when you're in the creative fields, like you kind of have to be your own archivist. Right, and, uh, um, uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity to kind of put the exact images up that you want with the exact context, because when we did this news story, like it's very fun and weird to be asked by the local news about your art projects. And I kind of actually liked what they put together. Um, and yeah, it's like a kind of unique opportunity um, because the issues are so, you know, actually they're, they're life and death issues that when you make work about it, you're super sensitive in context and the way things uh, are vocalized and uh, working with media outlets, it, like they have their own agenda. So um, that's a very kind of careful line. I'm happy to talk about that. Anyways, oops, can I not use the keys here? Um, this is uh, that project that Public Public Address, which um, again, to remind you is a collaboration. So I'm one of three people. And it was a number of years before I did projects that were collaborative. I feel like I needed a lot of time on my own to see what my artistic voice was and what my interests were and even what the limitations of it were. As I got older and more established, I think I was looking for more uh, variability and camaraderie. And I had gotten to say some things on my own. And, um, you know, so like uh, socially engaged projects were not what I went to school. They're not what I studied. And they came about, uh, very organically. Uh, okay, so public, public address. Uh, this is where I would normally show you the news clip. Now, I think it is instructive to show you where this project came from. Um, in 2017, um, I had brought in a, a friend and colleague from another school, uh, UC Berkeley, Stephanie Sahuko, um, to do an artist lecture. And as part of that lecture, she actually stayed for a week and we had the opportunity to do a workshop. Um, and the workshop in these kind of contexts is sort of the nexus of, uh, you know, the visiting artist practice, the host artist practice, and you know, enlivening powerfully uh, the student body. So in 2017, we did a workshop called Speculative Descent Laboratory. And in short, what this workshop uh, is, is a way for us to look at protest uh, as a relationship between power, or I'm sorry, photography and sculpture and power, right? Because in a way, a protest is a bunch of people making sculptures to then be photographed that are intensely political and then they get mediated, right? Like those are some of the main components. And uh, so if you sort of try to, for a moment say, okay, yes, there's a ton of emergencies in the world. 
let's suspend those emergencies for the duration of a workshop and allow ourselves to play, right? Because there's a lot of interesting um, protein in here that is really powerful for artists and the world we live in, right? And, and in terms of making um, work that is a discussion about photography, is a discussion about sculpture, is a discussion about social engagement. So uh, one of the things that came out of this speculative descent laboratory is, what if we had protest signs that were images of protesters protesting from other protests, right? Another question was like, what if we had uh, protest signs that were green screen so that they, the, the actual protest images could be projected upon retroactively later infinitely? Oops, sorry, click. Okay, and then uh, another thing I wanna say or something I heard once, there's sort of a very precarious antagonistic relationship between art and activism with good reason. And one of the things that I've uh, felt, heard, absorbed about what one of the positive relationships that can emerge from that is that both artists and activists need and benefit from the other to reimagine this sort of main area of research or action that they come from. So artists need activists to become better artists. Activists need artists to reimagine what protest can look like. Uh, th those are my sort of stand-in sort of dialogical thoughts. Um, and, you know, when I get cynical or despondent, I try to remember that lesson. Here is a couple views of this workshop, which are kind of like a wall of um, iconic inspirational images, um, a lab where we had all sorts of um, stations that students could uh, sort of uh, intellectually and almost physically engage with content. Uh, here's the inspiration wall, everything from old protest, iconic protest images to Pepe the Frog. Um, there's a great documentary about Pepe the Frog on Netflix, I think it is or something. Uh, anyways, it was, it was like really wonderful. Uh, uh, what you're looking at is uh, this prompt, which was to create protest signage that literally acts as surveillance equipment itself. So. The students were um, taking this idea of protest signs that say something akin to the world is watching or we are watching or we are wear, uh, bearing witness to your, you know, the different forms of violence that, you know, the state might enact through literal or bureaucratic or, you know, law um, disenfranchisement, all sorts of forms of violence that the students um, they made protest signs that you could like slip your smartphone into and the recording device of the phone would be where the pupil of the eye is. And then when you held the sign, you were also like surreptitiously holding a camera and you were able to sort of like, you know, gaze back or record what was going on. Or you could give your audience sort of a protest, uh, like what is the protest sign see literally. Um, we had a green screen area just for mock-ups as a way to kind of be a net to catch the different sort of productive moments that were happening. Here's a mix of the protest signs, the protest signs also coming alive with these shots of people and bodies that are all obscured, but you start to understand like the human element, you know, this all goes back to like humanity and bodies um, and different forms of precarity in, you know, passion and literally walking on the streets. Another thing we did in the project is um, uh, we came up with this little practice on um, taking very uh, low res images off the internet and sort of upsampling them in Photoshop and then converting them to color halftone and then using everyday printers that are not art printers, but in this case, it was like the little workhorse color laser jet that we have in our visual resources department and um, putting together an image that we picked together as a workshop, which was an image of a limo on fire post-Trump 
uh, that uh, says we the people and uh, resing up that image it, and color half toning it and then tiling it and printing it and then re-adhering it to then go on another vehicle as an experiment, right? Like in this situation, we can make use a car to uh, be a prop for an image of a car that's a protest sign um, with this sort of weird little digital, uh, you know, methodology that we employed in the workshop. And of course, you know, then we got to like come together workshop participants. Stephanie, who's one of the three collaborators of Public Public Address is on the very bottom uh, left holding the resist sign um, with the sort of teeth, like with the sandals on. Uh, okay, so fast forward. Uh, last year, Stephanie was asked, or Stephanie has right now up a solo exhibition at the Blaffer Art Museum in Houston. And pre-COVID, she said, Jason, as part of my solo show, they want me to do a public workshop. And I thought, why don't I bring you and we do Speculative Descent Laboratory version 2.0. Um, so I said, yes, exciting. Um, we started to have proposed budgets and you know that I would do a site visit and we're already talking about plane tickets, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then COVID hits and, um, you know, so there's like this moment where we don't really know what's gonna happen. And the news every day is telling us one thing. And then the University of Houston has their own sort of evolving sort of vague uh, timeline of what their priorities are at a given moment. And then, so we're kind of just waiting for all these dominoes to fall. So anyways, we started to wonder in a fun way, right? Like what if we, so this is all digital, or in another, I think, very artist way of thinking about things is how can we make something that's uncancelable, right? And so when we asked that question, we started to think about digital things and I started to, digital context, and I started to think about a, a, an old artist friend whose work I really liked, who was one of the artists who, working in digital contexts, his work felt really alive and sort of progressive in terms of its visuality. And so uh, this artist is Sebrin Versteeg. And you're looking at a documentation of one of his works. Uh, this installation is called Today's Paper with Flies, which depicts the self-portrait image of the artist seated in front of their New York City studio, reading a newspaper. The paper's image within is updated with the latest edition daily, continuously reflecting the passing of time and the news of the moment. Over the course of a 24 hour cycle, algorithmically animated flies appear within the tableau with increasing frequency. So to translate that even more human, which is to say that um, typical of Sebrin's work, he's able to create a situation that literal like political and cultural news that is coming up is sort of in some way live feed populating part of the artwork. And then um, there's other little things that the artist programs that become sort of like asterisk aesthetic gestures on top of that real live footage or content that's coming in from the real world. So I was like, Stephanie, I'm thinking about Sebrin. And uh, then Sebrin, um, we approached Sebrin and Sebrin said yes which is like kind of awkward because we're like, here's a way that you work. And we didn't know if we were proposing to like hire him to help us with this project or to be an artist collaborator, which is like, we're not paying you. We're just all doing work. We don't think we're gonna get ever get paid for it, but we believe in it. And potentially it has sort of like uh, an aspect for the moment. Um, okay, here, just going back, this mo one moment from the uh, local news I really liked is they did this like cross cut, it, like you can barely see it. But I love this moment where they cr cross cut actual Tampa footage with our project because it makes me think about the way even that protests are documented, like what it is to use a long lens versus a short lens, right? Um, to zoom into something from a safe distance. And, you know, because we're building a digital space, there are no rules of gravity or time and space. 
So um, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, we knew we kind of wanted to have a little bit of a long lens feel, I guess, and then that has gotten more interesting. Okay, here's a really good learning moment in this project. So at first it was like, this is post George Floyd, people are angry, people are enraged. Um, not everyone can protest on the streets um, for a million reasons. So uh, we were like, let's come up with an initial list that tries to say, hey, major people out there who might not be able to protest, we see you and we'll try to name you without making an exhaustive list that people then just start skipping, right? So here's what we came up with. And then originally, I think we sort of communicated this project, which is like, mm, sorry, taking a sip, uh, of like this project is only for people who can't protest, but then feedback we got, cause we consulted with a lot of like activists and like kind of critical artists trying to find like, what are all the project ways this project can go wrong? It's like scary because the issues are real. It's a live project. We're sort of growing in public and you don't, there's a lot of, mm, there's a lot of things artists can do wrong, right? And you kind of want to have a healthy, self-criticality about it. Anyways, one of the things that we learned was that people, and it's funny because you guys can't see me, but I have a physical disability. I am like, to put it in dumb words, um, I'm like fairly abled in a lot of ways. I can walk around, I can protest. I have kind of chronic um, um, pain at the age of 44. So I can still go to protest, but I wind very quickly and then I'll feel it for days afterward. Anyways, um, so even as someone who counts them as themselves as like on the ability spectrum, I was even getting some of this stuff wrong, right? Which is like people said, hey, we don't wanna be singled out. We just want a new context where everyone can have the same access, right? We don't want like our own special little march. And I think that's a really important thing. Oh. Actually, you can kind of see now what I look like. So this is an example of, all right, we can build this project off of smartphone submissions, right? People aren't gonna go into green screen. They're not gonna be able to edit. Let's just have it so people can submit smartphone footage, like five seconds, and then we'll go in and edit as best we can. So that's the before and after, or one version of it. There are many versions in this project. Uh, and then, uh, like a lot of things, we kind of got our act together and we got some test feed together and we started to communicate online uh, through Instagram, Facebook, our own social networks. Uh, and we started to get submissions. And this is one of the earliest submissions that we got. This is Lucy. She lives in Michigan, uh, 16 years old. And when I saw this, I was just like, yes, this um, embodies so many things about the project. But in a way, what I like about this project or working um, in these sort of socially engaged ways is that the more people you get, the more people can see themselves in the project. So in a way, I want you to think that, or one way I look at the submission is like, young people might see themselves in this project more because of the submission. Um, people who have physical uh, different abilities might see the cane that is in the submission as a surrogate or a stand-in for all sorts of other conditions. Some are visible or more intensely visible and some less visible. So I want you to think about that as I scroll through these. In this instance, the participant actually made a green screen sign and then animated it to say, um, to have this sort of four message animation, which was amazing, right? Um, and this person uh, has uh, citizenship concerns. And so a lot of people might see themselves in this because a lot of people, they, I, they might not even thinking about being anonymous. Sometimes they just have the protest sign in front of their face. In this case, the protest sign is above their face and they've covered their face. 
right? So they're like making a point of it. Um, hold on, I'm gonna, sometimes I have to move you guys around on my screen. Okay, uh, a mother and daughter, uh, tiled floor and tan um, wall. What I like about this project too is because the selections that we do, we have to do it by color. So the selections that we get are imperfect. And so sometimes errant doorknobs and electrical outlets end up traveling with people into the protest stream. And it used to drive me crazy at first. And now I love it because the, the um, awkwardness of our selections um, actually make the project way more human instead of a professionally edited like drug commercial or car commercial. Wow, more people of color should own guns with a gun in a waistband. I was like floored to receive this. And I was like, okay, like now I have to think about what is it to be a person of color who's thinking about guns and marching with a gun, right? But like multiple things are happening in this submission. Um, uh, this is uh, a friend, an artist and professor in Ohio. If you can breathe, help those who can't. This was the first um, uh, submission like this. I think this sub participant is 91 or 97. Um, this participant is the daughter of the previous participant. So this is a lesson in the project, right? I started to realize that, you know, we're always seeking um, and excited for people to join us. But another possibility of the project is even if someone who's able-bodied, maybe one way they can help, uh, they, can, they can participate is to help someone who can't protest film a submission rather than doing it themselves. So that's kind of a wrinkle that it took me a while to think about and makes so much sense, right? not acting as a direct participant, but acting as like a surrogate or an enabler of somebody else. Um, one way this project has grown is that um, we, uh, through some pre-existing relationships, we, had a, we have a relationship with Black Lives Matter Tampa. And remember that we, three of us live in different cities, um, Oakland, Tampa, and New York City. So I had a relationship with Black Lives Matter. I asked them, they were excited about the project. They posted it on their um, Facebook and we got some submissions from them. And then one way the project has sort of wrinkled and gotten more complex uh, because it's sort of like a living growing project in a lot of ways is like, well, many protests have a megaphone moment. You march, you march, you stop. One person takes the megaphone and they speak to why we're here and they might pass the megaphone and you might have one speaker, you might have five speakers. Um, it is sort of a culminating um, sometimes moment when you do go out and protest where it is a really sort of, it's a declaration of what is at stake. So we thought, you know what? Um, Black Lives Matter is interested in this project. Um, this is an internet project. We could actually just zoom in with them and we could pull a Zoom screen over the protest feed and have a long form conversation with them. So the thing that we got to do and learn from was this can also be a broadcast platform. Long form conversations uh, are really opportunities that aren't given to a lot of activist orgs because you'll see more local news, right? Heightened you know, things that have to do with um, perceived violence and conflict and danger rather than the multiple sort of very important forms of labor um, and uh, community uh, engagement and social welfare and bodily welfare that these organizations participate on. So we were like, hey, do you want to have a long form conversation rather than sound bites that we can archive this it might be that in 10 years, people are really trying to hear more first-hand ac hand accounts of the actual activists. Um, and that's, uh, so just sort of building primary research who we don't really know what's gonna happen with it, sort of like putting it on record. And then we came up with um, sort of four pillars of the conversation. One, I just, um, uh, 
we asked them to speak to the political moment, right? That's just like a first prompt. The second was to talk about whatever their more kind of nuanced and thorough description of their initiatives and activities that they were doing, not just stuff that ends up on the news. Third is how people can donate if they want. And the fourth, and this was like the real magic at the end. So the night before we were like, well, let's talk about this conversation. And it was kind of hard conversation to have because I was a little bit like, what do you guys want to talk about? And they were like, well, what do you want us to talk about? And um, we were both like looking for the other one to sort of give structure. And um, through conversation with their lead organizer, we had hit this really interesting question, which was us asking the lead organizer, what are, what's a question you wish you were asked that nobody asks you? And she said, I wish people would ask me what are other things I wish I was doing with my life? And I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. Like no one talks about activists in these terms. And, you know, in business speak, there's this term opportunity cost, which is like, what do you sacrifice from option A by, you know, electing option B in any given, you know, business move. And so for someone who's committed themselves um, to a time in their life where like pretty much 24 seven, their life is activism and leading and trying to organize uh, and sort of like what feels like a life and death situation with many things spinning out of control all the time. And for the, that person to then talk about what they're giving up, a lot of us, myself included, have had a lot of moments in my life where I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm interested in. I'll try this for a little while. I'll work this job. I'll try that. Moments where we're stumbling into like the chaos and the variability of the human experience. And if you take social justice and life and death concerns and prioritize them, you never have the time to have these kind of questions. Um, and so I think having this conversation with Donna was a real powerful way to kind of make another point, which I think gets really underplayed. It was very educational to me. Um, and I think as an artist, one of the things I'm always asking myself is like, I wanna be surprised by the art I'm making. You know, and when this project got to moments where I'm like, wow, visually this is starting to look so cool or wow, we're having a conversation where more is at stake than I thought would ever be is really exciting. Here's what the Zoom dialog box looks in when it's just so, this whole time we're conversing, the feed is uh, going. Uh, okay, if you guys there were interested in participating and when I do workshops, which I'm happy to do a workshop there at Webster with any class, I can kind of zoom in. Um, here's kind of what we ask for people and I'm not only saying like, hey, we want your participation, but it takes a while to learn about what you're asking for. Like that's part of the art, the art making and the art process. So part was like learning to submit for yourself or acting as a surrogate, right? That was like something we learned by doing the project. Um, filling the frame in a vertical hold, right? Like we need some kind of like technical limitations to be able to work through the submissions that the text has to be legible, but there's an interesting thing that we learned, which is in when you're looking at the feed every 20 seconds, one of the protesters um, is overlaid and fills up the screen so that if their sign has a lot of content and it's harder to read in mass, that we rotate all the participants just so you can really read and see those people individually in a sort of uh, rotating basis, right? So that's a little lesson we learned in legible text. Hold the camera still as possible. If people can do a blank background, that's best or color it is super best, right? Cause that helps us get through more submissions. And then it was sort of like, well, what are we asking people to protest, right? And initially we had Black Lives Matter in the title of this project, but 
we started to get confused with Black Lives Matter. And we were like, we, even though what we do is we're feeling like we're doing a solidarity act, we got to take that out of the name because people are getting confused. And the people who are in Black Lives Matter or who are activists with a capital A, they put a lot at stake in like, it's a very, it's like, it's a big problem when people confuse you with that organization. So it's like, we need to like lean back um, and, you know, last introduce that, you know, what might be interesting for people to think about is that they can, you know, the whole project started out of feel, the feeling of like the, the political moment for Black Lives Matter, right? And so two options that people have, basic options are like, you can just say whatever you want in regards to your sort of support or relationship to Black Lives Matter, but it might be interesting at times for you, if you are immunocompromised to like identify yourself as a constituency that disappears sometimes, right? So you can might say immunocompromised for Black Lives Matter. Now the person, also we got an education about participants being bed bound, right? Like someone's like, well, when you say how participants march for the camera, what if someone can't march? Well, okay, now I feel bad and I'm getting an education and I need to think more critically, right? So then we started to introduce this language about, you know, being red, um, bed bound or house bound. And in this case, you know, this is pretty much bed bound. Um, and this is, uh, this person was literally in hospice care when they submitted and this participant is no longer with us. So even in the few months that this project has gone on, like this is a submission where I'm like, maybe certain people will see themselves in this submission. Um, I certainly kind of like blew my mind when I saw it. And now I'm like, wow, this person is in memorial in this project. Like people don't know that, but um, and what these digital projects and it, like creating any kind of media content, you know, like the implications get really complicated really fast. Um, okay, we met, we made a website. This is already old. It's like a little bit improved. We try to keep it really simple. It crashes all the time. Um, what we're doing on this website, um, which we tried to make as simple as possible is the links just go to Google Docs. When you're working as a collaborative group, it's much easier to have links go to like really basic documents that people can update anytime. I do workshops. This is a workshop I did with Arts of Life in Chicago, which is uh, an organization serving artists with developmental disabilities, which means a million different things. And uh, All right, so um, to kind of like end this little chapter, these are some of the ongoing questions of the project. Some of these are really complicated. They have no clear answers. They're sort of, uh, we try to establish the values of the project and we try to um, adjust and ask critical questions um, because the constituents and the stakeholders and the ideas that are involved in this project have really high standards. Right, and so like that's as an artist, something to think about, which is, you know, if you're gonna make work involving certain ideas or populations, sometimes making mediocre or bad work puts those constituents backwards from where they even were before the artwork. Uh, okay, a very, so it's a very different um, project, but, what I just showed you and what I'm going to show you are very much sort of like ongoing projects. Um, this work was prompted by um, a conversation I got or an invitation I got from a curator, which is, would you like to be in an exhibition about metadata? 
And so I was like, oh my God, what does that even mean? Um, and uh, so my brain was like on fire in the corner all the time. And so after I gotten that invitation, which is sort of an open, I, open invitation to think about it and propose ideas, um, I was staring at my webcam cover that was on my laptop and I was looking at it being sort of a gross piece of tape that had wear and tear, that had folds and was an index uh, and a palimpsest and a gate and a lens cap and a firewall and, you know, all of these things at the same time. And I was like, oh, like, how do I manifest this? Like, the more I think about it, this uh, sticker is um, not in a computational way, but in a poetic way, a kind of metadata, right? And I think sometimes, and I even asked the curator, like, hey, look, I'm going to make some proposals, but they're not computational projects. They're poetic, you know, like even almost misconstruings of what metadata is. I think as young artists, it's important for you guys to think about how do I problematize words? Like I'm gonna use this word wrong or I'm gonna make it elastic. So um, after being like, well, maybe I'll make a big version of my webcam cover. I was like, well, maybe I'll start collecting them. So my collection started. And here it is. And just already with just this amount, I was getting really excited. And um, one of the ways I think about these as um, the world's smallest protest signs. Um, and sometimes when I say that, I got a lot of good response. Like it was sort of like a hook people could sink their teeth into. Um, it's not the only way I think about them, but it kind of has a little bit of a headline like hook to it. And um, collection grows. I start to like, I get, get nicer wax archival paper that I can stick them on, right? Like I'm not just sticking them on. Um, then I made, one of my goals was to collect at least a hundred so that I could make an animated GIF. I've worked with animated GIFs before. I've made a full length movie that's comprised with a collaborator only of animated GIFs. Um, one of the ways that artists use GIFs is as like, a kind of archive. So if you have something that has like 20 things in it or a hundred things in it, um, you can just make a GIF and it becomes sort of this overview of, a, of an archive that you can kind of like throw online. It's like the lightest, cheapest, freest, easiest way to kind of introduce a collection um, digitally, right? So I was like, I want to make uh, a gift that shows that I'm taking this seriously, that there's such a range of submissions, right? Um, and that people might start to see like, well, some of these are flashy and some of them are plain. Like, it seems like this guy is interested in anything. Here's a nice scanned one, right? It's the opposite of an animated GIF, like a nice, you know, 600, 1200 DPI scan. Um, and then I got asked, so the way, original way I started to think about installing this, and I still think about it, is that like I wanted to take over, you know, like a museum wall and have like a 20 or 30 foot wall and have each original webcam spaced apart like a foot in rows and columns. So like at a distance, it barely seemed like in the wall had anything on it. And then as you got closer, you'd realize there was this grid. And then I could like still hang other works like over the grid or, you know, so I had, a, I still have a lot of ideas, but someone was like, we went, we're interested in your webcam work and we're doing like a photo show. And I was like, uh, so I started to take these high res scans and I, this is what you're looking at. It's, I've printed it once and uh, I did a smaller version for this exhibition. This is a 40 by 50 inch photograph. And so I basically like, put every high res scan as its own layer. And then I select auto select layer. And then I just treat this photographic space, this Photoshop file as an installation space, right? And so the future ways I think about this is like what I really like to do is make this a 50 by 70 inch photograph, like a very mon monumental sort of scaled 
work, collect more, have it at least this density, if not more. Um, and then the other version is because this is such a people's project, I basically wanna make like an addition of three or five of these monumentally scaled ones. And then I wanna have like a $10 poster version, which most people could get. And um, that could populate artist studios and funny corners of places um, because that's really the heart of the project, right? And um, so those are ways I'm kind of thinking about how this might exist in the world. Here's like a little bit of a zoomed in. There's so many stories in these, so many unanswered questions about what some of this stuff means. Um, I have ideas that I think about like in terms of moving the eye around and color. And it took me a while to come up with this background color, but after a while, I kind of thought of this color as a little bit internet-y, but like not neon internet-y, it's like muted. And if I desaturated, the color and the color felt airy, then these scans would come forward. Like they would pop against it a little more. It took me a while, but I just kept filling in this background. And now I feel like for reasons I can and maybe can't yet articulate, I'm really happy with how this is shaping up. Um, I pitched this project or whatever. After many years, I'm always blasting things out Developing a mailing list as young artists is really important. You forget how many people you engage with and people call it networking. But what I try to do is like, I've always, like for so many years I've been an artist. I'm really interested in art. I see a lot of like real old and dead artist work. And I see a lot of really young, definitely alive artist work. And I'm interested in all of it, right? And so because of like being earnestly interested, I feel like uh, networky stuff, um, like it doesn't feel like networking. I'm just interested in stuff. I try to tell people when I like their work, you know, it's like you're participating in an artist economy, which is like you show up, you vocalize, you ask questions, you celebrate people. You are like, oh my God, I can't believe you made that. You know, when people have done that to me, it makes a big effect because you're not always selling stuff. You're not always getting shows, but sometimes when you hear from another artist, like descriptive and very specific feedback or really celebratory feedback, it really helps. Um, Vice, when I um, pitched this, cause I had maybe worked on some, um, the writer um, with another project. So, you know, whenever I have like big studio moments, I just try to share with her what I'm doing. And she asked, what is your compulsion to collect? And I said, it's a form of love, a belief that these everyday materials radiate greater possibilities of bearing witness and present future meanings that generates the compulsion to collect. Collect collecting is also a necessary counterpoint to my other forms of making, which initially was to always pick up a camera, control it and execute an image. After making many images, I wanted to say less and listen more to introduce more chance and discovery in my practice and in the way I navigate the world. Um, I went to Chile, uh, a couple summers ago, or last, was it last summer? And so here's just like some ones that I collected just in my, you know, I was working in, on another project, but this is, I really like having projects that are like, it's almost like you're collecting crumbs all the time because sometimes projects move really slow and it's painful or you have collaborators and working with them is painful. So sometimes I'm like, I just want to have like, something that's a little bit like um, tiny streams of inspiration that change the way I walk through airports or coffee shops. Because now I'm always looking at people's webcams. Um, when people send me a webcam, a used webcam, I made a little dorky photographic sticker. Um, Mark Zuckerberg tweeted out this picture uh, a few years ago and someone could see that he had his webcam covered. So I found the highest res image of I could and I zoomed in on this detail. And so my webcam cover sticker, thank you, is a stick of like a photo sticker that is a picture of Zuckerberg's webcam cover. Um, and then here's another detail. 
Okay, so where are we? We're like 45 minutes already, right? Yeah, I think now is probably a good time to kick it over to uh, to, to questions if we want. Let um, me, okay, give me, I promise, 60 seconds and then I'll stop. Ready? Okay. <laughs> okay, the last thing, which I think is just kind of a nice way of ending this presentation, is my first project working with the public, which was very incidental and like kind of got a lot of engagement, was called Too Hard to Keep which is an archive that simply asks, do you have photos that are too hard to live with, but too painful to destroy? This is one of the first submissions I got when I asked just my close friends. And I was like, wow, I had a feeling there was something in this idea, in this image alone as validates and makes me wanna triple down on what this project could be. So I started asking friends and friends of friends and I started to get submissions. And this was in sort of like, MySpace days and early Facebook and I had a blog that I set up for this project and if you don't know what a blog is it's like Instagram like 10 years ago <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that as a joke but I mean I literally had a, I still have a blog spot blog that a lot of uh, submissions are archived on and just the project continued to amaze me here's what the um when I get submissions I would always just pick one I like the idea of holding a lot back right? And giving people only a kaleidoscope to look into the project in, as opposed to making it like a museumological, like, you know, like, like I try to be, it's like, I'm only one person and I, I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And I like stirring the pot. And then the last thing I'll say is um, a big thing I learned throughout this project that I had an instinct early on is that I could just like collect as many pictures as I could in sort of just wallpaper. But the way I chose to present this project is pretty minimally. Mm -hmm. And there's a big lesson in that for artists, especially young artists, which is that you partner with your audience in making meaning. And I felt like I only needed to like have a few dominoes up that the viewers could like knock over because I feel like a lot of what I'm interested in as an artist are things that you can't really see or see completely in the subject or the fodder or is the material on the edge of the subject where really the core is like you could never see this subject exclude like in its totality. And so it was really scary for me to do minimal installations, um, both aesthetically and conceptually. And it was really confirmed later that this was the right way of working. Here's a bigger installation. Here's just little shelves I started to incorporate for objects. Here's what a bigger installation looks like. Some things are out of view and become sort of just generic couple images, like you can't see them, but I think that has value. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and now I'll stop. Okay, but I just thought that would be a great relatable yeah. ending. No, I'm glad that you were able to dig into that project because that was sort of, I think, my entry point into your work. Um, and it was one of the, that was, that was, I think the first project uh, that I ever saw you speak about was too hard to keep and it kind of blew my mind. Um, which I think probably will change in a few years because I, I think printed photographs now are more of a rarity. Oh yeah, uh, it's totally dead. Um, I, I think also uh, I'm, I'm wondering about like the webcam cover covers if that's even a thing anymore because we spend so much time using our webcams now it's almost like you know post uh or now that like we're in the digital age it's like maybe we've gotten even we've just accepted the fact that like you know we're we're being recorded all of the time yeah that's a great point and like as an artist when you're trying to work with things that are like live wires like, God, I was reading this interview with Luke Toymans in the Times, and he was like, as a painter or as an artist, you shouldn't be an ambulance chaser. And I was like, what does that mean? But like the red, the way he meant it was like, there's a risk, or he didn't like artwork that was like about issues that were happening right now. And it's like, you're Luke Toymans, you can do whatever you want, you know? Um, and I would, so I like to like absorb like, huh, what would it be like if I was that kind of artist? And then also flip it over, like what's so problematic about that or whatever. Um, 
but yeah, like your projects can age, they can become really irrelevant all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think about all these projects as like monuments, like the webcam thing is just a monument I can like take with me anywhere I could like print and it could go up in a space and then it could come down and go someplace else. And um, also, I mean, I'm not perfect, right? Sometimes I do projects and they remind me, Jason, if you care about this, keep using webcam covers. Do I have webcam covers on my computers right now? No, I'm kind of in a lazy, like I'm just hustling, trying to keep, you know, so it's not that even I've mastered it, you mm -hmm. know, like I can't follow my own best practices. And, uh, you know, sometimes the projects are the same as writing a sticker that's like, turn off the heat before you leave the house. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's what kind of makes these projects interesting is that like they don't stay the same. And and it's also and every single time you exhibit a lot of these projects, it changes like how you show the work changes. So there's, there's, something, there's something about it that because of that constant change, like it feels alive. So like it's it's going to 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 move and evolve regardless uh, so yeah it might become irrele irrelevant at some point but that in and of itself is going to be kind of interesting and then change the dialogue so um anyways i'm rambling uh no that was yeah it's there's pros and cons to having projects that are very topical or alive and they will fail harder or they will lock in like mm -hmm. surprisingly elegantly mm -hmm. and you know you just have to be willing to put yourself out there um, but I'm always interested in looking at the art where I'm like, oh my God, like I, as artists, I think like courage is a huge res natural resource. Like I only have to do courage to do things because I've seen so many artists push themselves and what's accepted, right? Or just inventive or topical or non-topical. Like you just are building up the courage to do things all the time. And sometimes you're like, well, of courage is low and sometimes it's high, right? And you can afford to take risks or you just can't disappoint yourself one more time. But that's the biggest thing about seeing work and communicating with people is like people encouraging each other, right? To be like, what if you really weren't making artwork for other people, but you were making it for you or that I, most of my projects started as like embarrassing ideas. I thought that I would, I had to like kind of push out to tell a friend to like test out the idea on. <laughs> and that still doesn't go away. You know, like I'm a mid-career artist and, you know, I mean, you get bruised and sort of um, a bit more resilient, but I mean, it's also like, I feel like a teenager when you have like what you think is a good idea. Like that's what we're all like, I keep going back for. I love the idea of like, this does have value this is pushing like what I think. And, you know, sometimes when you're in school for art and everything is assignment based, it's hard. You get abstracted from the responsibility of taking risks on your own. Someone's mm -hmm. doing that work for you. And once you get out of school, it's so nice and super scary. Cause you're like, if I don't work really hard, I'm going to be working at a job I don't love. Mm -hmm. And that is like the best incentive that I've ever had for making work at like the next level, whatever you're trying to think the next level is. All right. Does anybody have any questions for Jason? Come on, guys. So, uh, I, Stephanie, I think, uh, actually had a show at uh, the CAM in St. Louis um, last year. Uh huh. Um, so there was, I, I didn't know that she was a collaborator with you on that project. So I was really excited to see. Um, yeah. I mean, and it's interesting because the project is a braid and, um, Stephanie is like, so in demand and has so many museum shows happening right now. And Seabrin is in New York and also has, you know, so just communicating our wants and needs between the three of us mm -hmm. is like, you have to learn how to be an adult, use your words, wants and needs, what are your limits, 
Mm-hmm. And you know, you can't do a project without learning. You know, that is some real stuff that's like, it's more professional practices y stuff or becoming an adult stuff. And then you also just never want to become too much of an adult. You know what I mean? Like the whole point is that we're like, I want to have that oh my gosh moment. Well, and, and you have to be bold enough to ask them. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, as, as artists, you kind of have to like get good at asking for what you want and what you need. And like, you know, the answer is mostly going to be no anyway. So, you know, it's a great skill. You got to think about that young. And, um, you know, I also have seen so many artists who grow in fits and spurts that you're not, you had no idea. Like you're, you know, people surprise you. And that kind of what keeps me leaning into people's work. Like maybe I'm not in love with that project or projects A, B, or C, but then like out of nowhere, you're like, wow, they, they're really hitting their stride. And, um, you know, everyone's on their own learning curve. And so it's important to get, you have to be a community member as everyone Mm -hmm. is growing and, you know, all right, so we got we got one question and I think it's actually going to connect with what you were just talking about. Um, so who is someone recently whose art has helped encourage you? Maybe like within all of all of the shutdown and the cultural changes that I guess we've been going through, like like what's encouraged you? Well, like, in a way, like my easy answer is that Sebrin's work right? Because we were like, oh my God, this guy has been working in digital realms that are- Like ever. He's been, he's been doing that for quite a while. Right. So I'm like, oh, right. We basically asked him, be a tripod leg. Like, will you be a tripod with us and we'll make this project together? Um, And I don't know, like, I guess I'm also interested Okay, I'm gonna sort of like artfully avoid trying to come up with another one, which in another way is to say that like, I'm looking at things all the time. There are contemporary artists, right? There are installations of artists who are dead and maybe the installation is, it's mm-hmm. it's like in a way the kind of risk taking. Yeah. Maybe it's a show on Netflix, right? Like there was this American murder show where like, they're like rebuilt this, protagonist's life in the show by calling all her amazing Facebook posts where Mm -hmm. clearly her relationship with her husband and their kids was the most important thing. I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, how do you tell a story uh, via Netflix, you know? So I guess what I'm trying to say is um, whenever I'm surprised or enamored, I try to take note, like what is the upending that's happening here? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think uh, I've never been a good, what's the word? Like, I tried to only be so much of a good student of photography because I always felt photography is a little bit navel gazy and people sort of white knuckle their own history. And I'm like, oh, like, or it's, sometimes it's good. You are like, okay, enough about the masters. I want to try other things or I want to rebel. So yeah. it's building up good piss and vinegar for ambition or risk taking. Um, and you can find that anywhere, even in the way that someone like certain friends of mine, I'm like, wow, the way when I take a walk with them and they are articulating like things that's happening in like signage, storefront signage. And I'm like, wow, they're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> and like, so it's everywhere and it's very democratic and you can access it for free if you kind of think about actively what it is moments of moments moments of wonder right do i feel alive and do i feel present and when i say do i feel present i don't say mean it in like the yoga sense or the hippie sense although i love and respect those (laughs) ideologies i'm like am i overtaken by my sensorium intellectually, poetically, physically, you know, like, does the work bring me in? And then I'm, I, I, I'm contending with the work and then contending in the work happens when you're in front of it sometimes, but then some work like 
you'll contend with it for 20 years and maybe like 20 years later, you're like, man, I've actually grown to love this work. Mm -hmm. So if you think about maybe work that has had a big effect on you immediately or over a long period of time, it was a very arduous path. You realize that what you do for other artists can do the same. Yeah. Right? And you, have, you can have more faith. Like, well, maybe people don't get it now, but maybe I'm trying to upend things. And so my audience is like later and I just have to be patient and stick to my artistic values, you know? Awesome. Well, I'm not gonna keep you for much longer. Um, thank you, that was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, I, I wanna also say thank you to our speakers committee who uh, has made it possible for us to bring you guys in um, uh, and, and invite you to speak with us. And hopefully at some point we can connect you with uh, with, I don't know, a class at Webster and maybe do a workshop. That would be really great. Yeah, if anyone's interested in, um, I'll, let, I'll just end with like a 20 second plug is um, we're really ex like, we're working, we're not ending at the election. We're going in a very open-ended way because the work that the project is built upon is work that is certainly not gonna end at the election day. Mm -hmm or in 2021. And so that was sort of another wrinkle. Whereas I think at first there was this sort of delineation of election being like everyone's goal, right? Kind of like every, and when vote, when people vote, they kind of take a breath sometimes. Yeah. You know, so it's like, God, maybe this project becomes important right after election day in another way, because it's like the work continues. If anyone's interested, you know, please reach out. The address is publicpublicaddress.com. The contact info is there and every submission is not only great because it represents you and your concerns, but by nature, it shows solidarity with all the people who have submitted so far, people who look at the project but haven't participated, people who are maybe really restricted and every person they see who's different, who looks different, who moves different, whose political message is different, they find camaraderie and interconnectedness in that. And so I guess that's my pitch. Awesome. Hey, I got a quick question. Yes. Um, what, do, what do you think is the best way to put um, work that has a social message out there, like particularly work that um, deals with like justice issues and, um, you know, like all these um, killings that are going on <laughs> right now? I mean, right. they're being publicized on social media. Like, would you would you suggest using social media as a way to put artwork out there? Uh, okay. My first answer is there is no right way and there is no wrong way. And yeah, social media changes everything. Um, and it's a complicated terrain. And I think the best way to think about it is to think about each context offers something, right? So I love doing workshops because I can see someone just scrolling past our posts on this project, like, cause it's so easy. Your thumb keeps moving. Mm -hmm. You have like five minutes until your class starts. You know, you haven't eaten yet. And so I, I totally get it. So social media is great because among three people who each have their own network, you know, it's a way of getting things started. Well, like I just heard about ArtStation. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Tell me. Hello. Um, yeah. Where artists post their work. Oh, I don't know ArtStation. Yeah, like you, you can, I think you can get your own website or whatever. And it's like a forum for artists to post their work or or like Reddit, Reddit has like artists and yeah. things like that where they can critique art and um, or, yeah. or where you can get a lot of feedback on art. Yeah, well, I just think you have to think about, well, like who is your audience, right? Like this public public address project, like the webcam, uh, uh, okay, the, the, the virtual protest is like, that's a big audience. Um, and so things that get us algorithmically or network wise away from us, like the, the algorithmic part is the easy part, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, I wanna reach people who are far away from us. Um, 
And so that's kind of like a weakness and opportunity in a way. Um, social media sometimes helps that or hurts that, mm -hmm. right? So every context we get, like you guys are in St. Louis, like I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, you know, like you guys are my twin in a way. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm like, man, I'm really excited to talk to people in St. Louis. Plus when I can really explain the project, like there's maybe a different level of investment that you might understand or be empowered because I'm spending an hour talking with you guys. And that's like, I'm happy to do that. It's like a wonderful opportunity um, because a lot of this stuff may not really come alive for people when they see it on social media. And I get it, you know, I, I scroll through a lot too. So you're like thinking about, well, when am I cynical and when am I rushed? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think you try to think about everything as sort of an audience and a context with pros and cons. Uh, 123rd in state line is where I grew up, <laughs> Marissa Lane. Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you guys for your questions. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be seeing you, you again soon somewhere in the Webster sphere. Uh, oh. And if not, um, I hope you have a great day and good luck with uh, the project that you have going on. Thank you. Hugs, everyone take care of each other. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Jason. <laughs> have a good day. Take care.